Hello, my name is Gustav Hoyer, and I am a composer. Welcome to the Anachronism Podcast. Welcome back to a special Thanksgiving episode of the Anachronism Podcast. Today we're going to have a bonus double feature. We'll have two active listening activities on today's show, and both of them are focused on the idea of lyricism. Lyricism really is a way of acknowledging the primacy of the human voice in music making. So today's episode is a little overflowing, just like our Thanksgiving tables. I had a composer colleague, Daniel James Chan, who said something very evocative to me. He said, music is either trying to sing or dance. I thought that was a very poetic way to capture the human behaviors that sit behind music, speech and movement, singing being a form of specialized speech and movement, dance being a specialized form of bodily movement. Well, today we're going to take a trip through two pieces that have this first legacy in common, the, the history of singing. And a word that's often used to describe music that is connected to singing in vocal style is lyricism. And so this episode is about lyricism. The first piece we're going to hear is a piece for a string orchestra. It's a piece I wrote uh, a little more than 10, 15 years ago, actually now, about 15 years ago. And it characterizes a contrast between some orchestral colors unique to the strings and a, and a warm lyricism, like a song being sung. And the second, it's an actual song. We're going to listen to unaccompanied choir and the purity of the human voice, true lyricism as it's always been. So first, let's take a few minutes and ask, what is lyricism? And lyricism is descriptive of instrumental music that favors certain types of musical qualities over others. So in our earliest episodes, we talked a little bit about active listening and the different components you can listen for. Well, with lyricism, what we focus on is long phrases and shapes that are indicative of music that fits the human voice, music that has words underlying it, poetry. And that poetry gives the music its particular characteristics and makes it lyrical. So lyrics are the words we set to songs. Lyricism, or lyrical music, is instrumental music that has the characteristics of sung music. In many ways, the human voice is the first instrument. Very likely, our language and our singing grew up together. And when you listen to spoken words, you'll hear a variety of pitches and rhythms. And it's interesting that the spoken word of a culture, of a nation, finds its way into the melodic and rhythmic inflections of that national music. And the voice being the instrument that in some ways, when other instruments, when the non-vocal instruments are trying to be their most beautiful, their most compelling, very often it's when they are sounding lyrical like our own voices. So in both of the works we're going to listen to today, this idea of a melody being sung by a voice predominates. In one, there's an actual melody being sung by voices. In the other, it's the case of instruments, the strings, which have perhaps the most natural sound of approximating the human voice of a choir. So as you listen to the string music and then you listen to the choral music, see if you can make that connection between the way they sound and the breathing and the ebbing and flowing of sounds that the strings do and then what the voices do. So let's talk for a moment what does make music lyrical. If we describe something as lyrical, for me, it's music that tends to be smooth, connected together, That, in a similar way you might say a sentence, sing a word with multiple syllables. Generally, when singing, it's considered poor execution or poor technique to break a word up by putting pauses or stops in the sound between syllables. And we'll do an example in a minute. So what you have in lyric music is syllables and words connected together into phrases and clauses that are typically uttered with a single breath, unbroken. And it's considered uh, very fragmented if you speak or hear those words spoken in a way that breaks up those phrases. Let's do an example. 
First, let's listen to the following quote from Karl Krauss. Language is the mother of thought, not its handmaiden. Now we're going to break that up and we're going to say some pauses between the syllables of some of the longer words. And let's see if this sounds natural. Language is the mother of thought, not its hand made in. So you can hear how unnatural that phrase and the meaning of it is broken up when you put pauses in, and music is the same. If you were to try and sing that phrase, you wouldn't want to break it up in between syllables, and you wouldn't even want to break it up between phrases, because let's take the next example. I'll read the words as they are, but I'll break up the sentence and break up the clauses and see if you hear how that fragments the meaning. Language is the mother of thought not its handmaiden. So that could be taken as a slow reading, but if someone spoke that way, it would be very stilted, and it would take extra work to understand what they were saying. Music's no different, and lyrical music that's designed to deliver words on the platform of melodies and rhythms needs to have those same long arcs of phrase that deliver a whole idea. And so that's partly what makes lyrical music lyrical. We learn to speak in the way that whole clauses are a single breath, one impulse. Well-crafted vocal music preserves this quality of spoken language, and it's using something called phrasing. And it's phrasing, musical phrasing, that helps the music support or uphold a concept in the text, and it isn't just putting pitches to each syllable. So without getting too technically involved with the nature of vocal music, there are other nuances to how syllables get treated, and maybe we'll deal with those on a subsequent show. But for today, I think you have a flavor of how language and how the natural structures of language create longer musical phrases, and that's lyrical music. So now that we've got a little bit of a grounding in what lyrical music could be, uh, we're going to listen to a couple of example pieces and see if you hear lyricism in action. The first piece is a piece as I mentioned earlier, I wrote about 15 years ago, and it's called Snowfall on a Midwinter's Eve. And it's from a recording that was released in 2007 of my first string serenade. And the serenade, the whole piece, is called Vignettes from an American Life. And this is the third movement. And uh, in the show notes, I'll have a link if you're interested in getting that album and listening to the whole string serenade. And there's also a string quartet on that album. But for for today's show, we're going to focus on that middle movement of that earlier string serenade work, Snowfall on a Midwinter's Eve. And it was inspired when I was driving on a snowy night in the northeastern United States. And it was dark. And in the headlights, as I was driving home on a long drive, I saw the snow. It was small and it was swirling in the headlights of my car. And I was warm and comfortable inside the car as I was driving. It was not a harrowing drive or a treacherous one. And I got to enjoy the beauty of the snow falling. And it brought to me a delight in that, that sight. And the delight of watching the snow from somewhere warm when you're inside and cozy and you look out the window. And you see the beauty of the snow. And even the light play of the wind with the snow. And... This piece evokes that feeling, that warmth of being inside and delighting in the snow on an evening. Now, the piece doesn't start in the car. The piece actually takes that moment of inspiration, but it actually carries us as an imagined walk outside. And it's when that snow just starts to fall. It's dark, and the way the light's playing on the snow that's already on the ground, uh, you head outside. And if you live in a place where it snows, you can actually try this, and you may be familiar with this sound. But if you go outside, and it's late enough that there aren't cars and other noises, maybe it's out in the country, and there's no wind, it's very quiet, and that if it's cold enough, the, the snow is very small, and it's a little icy. And if you stand out in the snow quietly enough, you can actually hear the snow landing on the ground. You hear the snow as it falls on the snow that's on the ground incredibly delicate, subtle sound. Well, in my piece, it begins with the sound of that snowfall landing, and it's 
the way I created that sound was using two subtle effects in the strings, the violins. And some are plucking, very lightly plucking, and some are tapping the strings with the wood part of the bow. That plucking is called pizzicato, and the tapping of the strings with the wood part is called colegno batute, to strike with the wood. And it's a clicking sound, and you'll hear both sounds at the opening. And it's evoking that quiet, dark of, of that first snowfall. Just take a quick listen to just that part. So with the snow falling, now that warm and cozy song begins, and you'll hear it in the low strings. They begin to pour out the memories of the hearth as you stand in the cold of the snow and the peace of a quiet, snowy evening. And this song is the lyricism in this work, and you're going to hear this song come back several times in the piece. This song weaves and folds through, and it yields to some middle section where there's some new music that starts to grow and swell, and it leads to this big melancholy cry in the middle of the loneliness and solitude of winter, right in the middle. And after that, that intensity wanes back and dies back. It's suddenly you're aware of that quiet, delicate sound of the snow falling, its subtlety and the solitude of it. the wind picks up and that falling snow starts to whirl and spiral beautifully in front of your eyes and the flakes in the snow are dancing in the enchanted whirls and spirals in the air and you hear those whirls and spirals listen to this brief section And now let's listen to the whole piece, Snowfall on a Midwinter's Eve.
And so now we move from the evocation of singing or the suggestion of singing with the instrumental strings to actual singing. The next piece, Miserere, it's a choral piece, and I composed it to accompany a very powerful play written by a friend of mine who is a playwright, Bryce Lennon. His play, Acts, the three-man show, it's a tour de force of acting for three actors who adopt and alternate many characters, and it's a full-length stage play based on the historical events in the book of Acts. Throughout, there are occasions of incidental or background music, and the music plays points to heighten the drama or the emotional intensity. But this piece, of all the incidental music I wrote, is the only vocal piece, and it occurs at the very end of the play. The main characters of the whole play are the apostles Peter and Paul, and you've been following them throughout this play. And now it's at the end. They're both being martyred for their faith. And the stage drama depicts each of their ends one after the other. Peter is crucified upside down, and Paul is beheaded. And this piece is a tapestry that hangs behind them in the air. And as I was contemplating these very powerful moments of martyrdom and death and and the confrontation of the ultimate things, I realized that the unaccompanied sound of the human voice is the perfect match, the cry of the voice. There is nothing so defining of our humanity as our mortality and our awareness of that mortality. So I got a choir together and this the Grace Community Church Choir, and this is Bill Brandenstein conducting, got this ensemble together and this pleading prayer brings lyricism to the fore. All of these text is, as it were, the inner voice of these martyrs as they're facing their death in Rome. So the text is a Latin form of an ancient poem by the Hebrew king David. And in his Psalms, Psalm 51 has this text. Now David would have written it in ancient Hebrew, but it was translated by the church into Latin. And Latin was the perfect language to be the text for this song because Peter and Paul are in Rome when they're being executed. So the text itself is solemn, and it's a cry for mercy from God. And it's not because the penitent person is worthy of mercy. It's a text that's based on an appeal to God because of God's mercifulness, not because of the worthiness of the person asking. And in Latin, it's miserere mei Deus, secundum maniam misericordiam tuam. In English, and if we preserve a very literal word order translation, have mercy upon me, O God, according to the very great mercifulness of yourself. Basically, Lord, have mercy on me because you are a merciful being. And this is being intoned by a choir of human voices to accompany the portrayal of the martyrdom of these two uh, characters on stage. So the vocal line begins in unison, male voices only, and it rises slightly with each request. These, this is a prayer asking for mercy from God, and so it rises up just a little bit. Miserere, miserere, miserere mei. Have mercy, have mercy, have mercy upon me. begins, it's too contrite to first utter the name of God. It doesn't begin by saying God, but it focuses first on be merciful. So the men sing this, have mercy upon me. And then the women's voices accent mei, have mercy unto me, upon me. And it accentuates the humility and the need at the moment.
And it's only after the whole choir gathers after that's said a few times that God's name is invoked in an awe-hushed tone, Deus. Miserere mei, miserere mei, miserere mei, Deus. Have mercy, have mercy, have mercy upon me, O God. From this reverent utterance, the music moves into a new set of phrases, and the text more directly declares the character of the one to whom the plea rises, this prayer rises to a God, and the penitent is reciting God's character of being merciful. It declares and it rises and builds in hope about the greatness and the magnitude of God's mercy. Secundum manium misericordiam. Secundum manium misericordiam tuam. According to the very great mercifulness, according to the very great mercifulness of yourself, and there's a moment this utterance builds and becomes more breathless and hopeful because of awe and suddenly becomes hushed and reverent as the penitent remembers they are before a God from whom they are seeking this great mercy. After this, the text returns to the opening text with increasing fervor, and there's a more complex inner linkage between the vocal lines and the sopranos, and the sopranos cry out the word Deus as the choir is saying, be merciful to me, be merciful to me. As appropriate for a prayer, the piece ends with the word Amen, let it be so. And as Amen is intoned, seven chimes feel, peel out the death of the martyrs and symbolizes how their deaths would become the seeds of the Christian church on earth as it would then spread into the world. And now let's listen to the whole piece, Miserere, from Acts the Three Man Show.
And so now the power of words, even Latin words, show what lyricism can mean, that the use of words and phrases create musical shapes that we call lyrical music. So I hope you've enjoyed listening uh, to these episodes, and now you can be on the lookout or the hear out for lyricism in music that you encounter during your day. Thanks so much. I hope you had a wonderful holiday, and I look forward to having you join me for the next episode when I'm interviewing composer Elena Specht. You won't want to miss that. Thank you. If you'd like to connect digitally, you can visit my website at gustavhoyer.com or find me on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for joining.